Well, thank you, Carla. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, as usual, we're talking about a controversial topic known as celiac gluten sensitivity, and we did that. They gave me the most controversial subtopic, that is the involvement of the brain. And again, this is quite a fascinating story because it is indeed very much a work in progress. Uh, the pathogenesis of this uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, and again, I want to focus on schizophrenia and now this mess as you know, prototypes, but you will see there is much more than that, has been evolved over the years. And again, when you talk about the controversy within the celiac or the gluten-related disorder community, you have no idea what's happened outside the world. This is extremely controversial how this disease come about. Nowadays, there is a general agreement that many, like many other complex diseases, even in these neuropsychiatric disorders, there is a component that is genetic and then an environmental trigger. But this was not a given until the very recent past. As a matter of fact, if we want to use as a, an example uh, the history of autistic spectrum disorder, this is a relatively short story. It starts in the 40s when uh, they were recognized for the first time. And then, you know, the knowledge and the science of autistic spectrum disorder went through what I would define the, 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 the dark time, uh, the time in which, uh, you know, everything was supposed to be psychologically driven. It was put a lot of claims and blames on the mothers that were listed and portrayed as hyperprotective as a prototype of the mother that will eventually have a kids with autistic spectrum disorder. Um, you know, uh, it, there, was, there are a couple of books that are fascinating that were written at that time to make the argument that indeed it was purely a, a psychological, uh, you know, condition. And then, you know, the same, you know, you know uh, studies uh, that were started in the 80s with, the, you know, the twin studies showing that definitely there is a genetic component, but there was not 100% concordance like for celiac disease, and that brought into the picture finally the possibility that the environment can have a role in the onset of this condition on a specific genetic background. That the genes are involved with GY studies, uh, uh, you know, ramping in the uh, early part of the, the 2000s, it became pretty obvious. This, for example, is the map of all SNPs of genes related to autism that have been identified. There are some, you know, quite interesting features here. There are some chromosome, like chromosome 16, it seems to be packed. And interestingly enough, you know, chromosome Y seems to be spared. So uh, this may eventually explain the four to one, five to one ratio of male females, because, you know, girls, they have a second chromosome X that can compensate in case of mutation of the genes on the other chromosome, when boys, they can't. Same story with schizophrenia, in which the same large, you know, array of genes have been identified. Um, and again, these are all correlated studies and who does genetics or complex diseases like celiac disease and this kind of condition knows very well that these are just markers, but the mechanistic link, the importance of these genes with the disease is still not totally clear. However, there were some factors that clearly pointed out that genes was not the entire story. Again, I don't want to go too much into details, so you can see from the slides, but definitely the fact that the, the, there was no, and there is still no, genetic model for autism in an animal model, uh, that there were clearly some epidemics uh, and epidemiological evidence in conditions other than autism, but neuropsychiatric conditions um, that seems to point to some environmental factors, but most importantly, the fact that there's been a rampage and epidemics of these conditions, like matter of fact, celiac disease and probably non-celiac gluten sensitivity, all you know, seems to suggest that the environment plays a tremendously important role in the onset of the disease. These are probably the most remarkable and uh, you know, telling evidence of what's going on here, particularly for um, 
autism, you see the timeline of that graph on the left is only 25 years. In 25 years, a timeline too short to blame genetic mutation, the prevalence of the disease went from 1 to 5,000 all the way now, 1 in 68. So this is an old slide, CDC lost numbers that have been put out in 2014, 1 in 68. And if you consider again the male-female ratio, we will lose one boy out of five in the next generation to autism. That's what's going on. And similar trends with some variation have seen with schizophrenia. So the question is, what is driven these epidemics? Um, and again, I don't have the time to go in through the deep details, but this is a prototype, a scheme that leads me to introduce what was really the issue that I want to put on the table today of this gut-brain axis. And again, this scheme that we've been following for the past decades applies to many complex diseases. And again, I don't have too much time to go through it, but it really boils down that whatever is happening in the ecosystem in the gut may have tremendous consequences, not only at the intestinal level, but way far from the intestine, including the brain. So if you follow the left-hand side and you are the lucky person, they are born by vaginal delivery, no infection in the first three years of life, no abuse of antibiotics, you are fed the proper nutrition, and again, we can spend an entire symposium to define what proper nutrition is, you eventually develop a balanced ecosystem, what we technically call the microbiome. Now it is pretty obvious, because the evidence are very, very strong, that is the microbiome, particularly in the first two, three years of life, to train the immune system to become telogenic and keep us healthy. Conversely, if you have you know, a situation for which you are out of luck, born by C-sections, a lot of infections, a lot of antibiotic treatments, you're not fed the way we're supposed to be uh, nourished as a species. You put this ecosystem out of balance, and this will train the immune system in a belligerent way, and eventually you develop the bar of unleash the inflammatory response, even when it's not necessary, put you at risk on a specific genetic background for negative clinical outcome. And we know now, because there are strong evidence in the literature, that the ecosystem of the gut is closely related to behavior, again, on a specific genetic background, to the point in which now we start to see reviews like this over and over again, exemplifying this concept of the brain-gut um, axis. And it's a two-way, so stuff that happens in the gut can affect the brain and vice versa. And again, this is a hot topic extremely controversial, but like any time that we go in unexplored territory, there are the uh, supporters and the ones that are critic, and then, you know, just time will build up the science to prove or disprove what is the theory here. But now, I believe there is almost a general consensus of the existence of such an axis. Now, in terms, back to the story of the autism epidemics, what are the driving factors? Well, there are many that have been put on the table, but for those that have a little bit of experience with kids with autism, um, you probably know that among all the intervention that these kids, they go under, and there are 50 plus possible treatments that have been put on the table, the most popular is the gluten-free case and free diet. It's by far the intervention most used in kids with autism. Now, what gluten does in the brain? Again, if you go through the list of the claims that your patients come into your clinic, even with bona fide celiac disease, you will see, you know, many, many of these symptoms. Again, short memory loss, anxiety, depression, and so on, irritability, uh, uh, seizures, um, of course, ataxia. Uh, um, there are some questionable issues. They are the ones that we're going to discuss today, besides you know, schizophrenia and autism, ADHD, and so on and so forth. And there is a clear you know, trend. But 
correlation does not call, means causality. That doesn't mean the necessity, you know, uh, gluten doing this. Uh, that's something that is a work in progress. And that's what I believe is going to be fascinating to really study more in details. This applies to many of these symptoms, probably with the exception of ataxia, because I believe that we have very, very strong evidence that gluten is the driving force for ataxia. Now, uh, many studies have been done uh, to try to figure out, you know, what is the impact of gluten on these conditions. For example, using the same approach that Umberto told us as a biomarker for non celiac gluten sensitivity, there have been studies, this is from Peter Green's group, in looking at the, uh, you know, uh, prevalence of anti-gliding antibodies um, in, uh, you know, patients in, this, in uh, um, you know, uh, kids with autism, and again, you will see here that particularly the IgG antibodies are much higher in kids with autism than uh, general population or their siblings. And a similar study has been done by Laura de Magistri and the Saponis group in which not only they detected the increase of these antibodies, but once these kids went placed on a gluten-free, casein-free diet, the anti gladin antibodies and the anti casein antibodies went down. Uh, as expected uh, based on what uh, Umberto told us in terms of uh, response. So uh, again, uh, because I don't want to spend too much time and I want to really leave as much time as uh, possible for the discussion, I'm going to summarize five years of extreme controversy, far to be settled theories, not necessarily mutually exclusive, how this all you know, comes, comes about in terms of, you know, this pathway that leads to, uh, you know, change in uh, uh, neuropsychiatric, you know, outcomes on a specific genetic background instigated by gluten. There is a, one theory that said you eat gluten, as we all know, is forcing only partially digested some of these peptides can make the journey through the intestinal barrier, both transcellular and or paracellular, and some of these peptides, they have a structure very similar to chemicals that control our behavior, we call endorphins. As a matter of fact, these people call these peptides gliodorphins. And according to this theory, these gliodorphins comes in the bloodstream, reach the blood brain barrier, and eventually binds to, uh, you know, endorphins receptor, and that makes you to change behavior and the outcome depends who you are. If you're genetically skewed to develop schizophrenia, that's your clinical outcome, autism, and so on and so forth. There is a second theory that, in my humble opinion, makes more sense to me, and again, not necessarily mutually exclusive for the first one, in which the first steps are the same. So there are these peptides, they are incompletely digested, they cross the intestinal barrier, they come into lamina propria, and as we know, they instigate the first seat of an immune response in, uh, at the beginning innate and then adaptive immune response. Now, this immune response may lead to the activation of some immune cells that can migrate into the brain and create neuroinflammation there. Or uh, that this activation of inflammation has a repercussion on microbiota which change the metabolites it can eventually be responsible for the change of the uh, behavior of these individuals. We have done some studies on schizophrenic individuals, and with our major surprise, what we found in, in a study that was aimed at establishing the percentage of individuals with schizophrenia that may be affected by celiac disease or non celiac gluten sensitivity, a tremendous discre discrepancy between the TTG positive individuals that turns to be anti-endomysium negative. We're not talking about borderline positive TTG. These were people that were strongly positive, five, ten times more normal for TTG, but negative for anti-endomysium antibodies. And this positive TTG turns to be positive for TTG6 rather than TTG2. And the idea is that this can indeed be a biomarker on neuroinflammation and schizophrenia for those individuals that leads to this neuroinflammatory process through exposure to gluten. And matter of fact, uh, we found roughly 25% of schizophrenic individuals that are TTG6 positive. And 
with the support of the NIH in collaboration with some colleagues at the University of Maryland, we're doing a clinical trial with, you know, a gluten-free diet challenge that you can imagine how difficult it is with schizophrenia individual. This has to be done in inpatient to prove indeed that that's the case. And the preliminary data that I heard are quite remarkable. The other thing that we've been able to do, because we have access to uh, brain cadavers from individuals affected by neuropsychiatric conditions, including schizophrenia and autism, we were able to find out that, you know, folks that they have biomarkers of possible non celiac gluten sensitivity, they also have increased inflammatory gene, gene expression inflammatory marker like metalloproteases and also changing in uh, the expression of genes that control the blood brain barrier, make the blood brain barrier leakier. So again, these are very preliminary data, very initial data, but quite remarkable and um, you know, provocative data. And I think that again, uh, the aspect of gluten impact on the brain and how this outside CD disease and probably in the real non CD gluten sensitivity can be studied in terms of the spectrum from the simple headache all the way to this much more severe condition that I just told you. I'm going to finish off just to acknowledge my group because, of course, you know, these are the folks that do the stuff. I just enjoy hearing what they're doing there and here and there. If they want my opinion, I will volunteer to do so. Thank you so much.